Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the Spark seminar. Uh, I am Maciej Mazurowski uh, at Duke University. <clears throat> uh, at Duke Spark is an init initiative uh, here at Duke uh, with the goal of uh, advancing artificial intelligence uh, in medical imaging. Um, here's our website and uh, some social media. And uh, whether you are a Duke or, or outside of Duke, if you'd like to uh, join us and collaborate, uh, please uh, email me at uh, uh, this email address. Uh, and today we have a, a very interesting presentation from uh, Dr. Timothy Dunn. Uh, uh, he is an assistant professor uh, of bi biomedical engineering here at Duke. Um, he focuses on development of technologies uh, to understand the brain. Uh, and today he will present on a, a couple of different topics. Uh, it will be a, a somewhat uh, different presentation today, a very interesting use of uh, computer vision and deep learning um, for a uh, for a, a less usual uh, type of uh, images. Uh, so, uh, uh, Tim, uh, welcome and uh, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, is this working? Uh, yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the great introduction, Machich. I'm going to talk about two different stories, as Machich said. One is related to sort of unconventional from the perspective of this group, medical images, and it's related to using computer vision to quantify animal behavior in preclinical context, both to try to get at a more quantitative understanding of, of the brain and neurobiology, but also starting to be able to quantify and detect differences in behavior as they're expressed in different disease states in response to, uh, to different drugs. And I hope as I'm presenting these results, it'll primarily be on animals, but it, you know, it is related to translational work and I hope that you maybe can start thinking about how what I show could be applied to human patients in a clinical context. And in fact, while I won't show any data today, we are beginning to apply what I'll show you in the first part of this talk to human patients for Parkinson's disease and dystonia. And we're developing collaborations with many other groups at Duke and elsewhere to, to study other types of, of disease phenotypes that all rely on quantifying movement with high resolution. And then after that, then I'll maybe go to a more you know, Duke Spark conventional story. And it will be related to a bigger project that my group is working on to develop decision support tools for traumatic brain injury and trying to build multimodal models that combine tabular EHR data together with CT brain volume data. And specifically, it'll be a smaller story about something that I'm excited about and that we've had some recent success with and that will be related to how we've developed rule-based language models for extracting CT image labels that are necessary for training downstream models. Okay, so the first part, the animals. So preclinical behavioral phenotyping via deep movement profiling. And the way that I like to start this part of the talk is to sort of put back on your you know, mysteries of neuroscience hat. You know, if you think about all the different technologies that have been developed for understanding the brain, you know, primarily in animal models, but you can think of analogous situations for, for humans. There's been a tremendous amount of investment and success in a few core technologies. One of those has been wiring, so doing serial section electron microscopy and getting these really detailed ultra structural images of the way in which neurons are connected in the brain. You know, we now have all of these amazing tools for measuring genes and gene expression and manipulating genes and gene expression, and that's really aided our understanding of the brain. And we also have these new amazing tools for you know, brain wide neural activity imaging. Um, and also neural activity recording with electrophysiology. And so this down here is actually a picture from some of the work that I did in my PhD. I used to work on zebrafish and we did whole brain neural activity imaging using these fluorescent calcium indicators called GCAM. Okay, but we have all these amazing tools. They're really helping us unravel some of the mysteries of the brain, but this one core piece of the technology puzzle has gone you know, relatively ignored 
And that's new tools for measuring the actual output of the brain, the behavior of the system, right? So the movement and behavior of the system, relative lack of tools in this domain. And that's something that I set out to solve. Um, another example that draws a distinct contrast between what we're able to do in terms of neural activity and not able to do in behavior is that we get these very high dimensional data sets now of neural activity in animals. And so this is an example of 10,000 neurons recorded at one time in the animal. But at the same time as this is being recorded, we're measuring behavior and trying to explain the behavior in terms of that activity. We have these relatively low dimensional and constrained behaviors that we're typically able to measure. Right? So this big dimensionality mismatch, we're missing this advanced behavioral quantification. Similarly, in terms of animal models of disease, there are a lot of important animal models for disease. Here's an example of a dyskinesia in a Parkinson's model of mice. And you know, people would like to explore the efficacy of various therapies or the neural mechanisms underlying these disorders. And they need to observe the behavior to see how well those, those treatments you know, are working. But the state of the art for quantifying the symptoms right, that you just saw of that animal in that video are still to this day, manual approaches, right? Where you have a little spreadsheet and you're literally marking down manually with some tally the number of times the animal does something weird, okay? And actually, um, you know, similar strategies are, are used currently, state of the art in movement disorders in humans, right? So it's a lot of manual observation and scoring and this, I hope that you can see how that might lead to issues with reproducibility, issues with precision, um, issues with scalability, et cetera. Okay, so, all right. So in summary, we have developed new tools, computer vision based tools that use deep learning to quantify animal behavior based on video recordings and then analyze animal behavior to reveal new properties of behavioral expression, new temporal patterns of behavior and how those different variables of behavior change in, in disease. Okay, so if we wanted to measure behavior as precisely as possible, we would look towards this technology that's been developed in humans, primarily in the entertainment industry, and this is motion capture. So motion capture, if you don't already know what it is, an actor puts on a suit, attaches little beads to points that uh, we want to track in 3D, and then there's a large array of cameras somewhere in the room, and each of those cameras, if it's calibrated, so you know the relative position and orientation of the cameras, if you detect each point in each image, in each of the different videos, you can then triangulate the detected 2D points to 3D and get this 3D skeleton, which you can watch evolve over time. And this is a relatively complete description of the movement of the body, right? And so we hope to move towards something like this in animals. The problem with just taking motion capture and transferring it to animals in order to measure behavior is that there's a few key issues with motion capture technology, especially when applied to animals. One is that animals don't want to wear little markers, right? So they'll chew them off or they'll shake them off. So using a marker-based approach is not going to work. Second, these really large camera arrays are expensive and not scalable. And if you want to get this technology in the hands of neuroscience researchers around the world, you need something, something simpler that can you know, work out of the box without expensive equipment. Finally, if you think that it might be useful to measure animal behavior in natural contexts, so where there's stuff in the environment that the animal's interacting with, and, right? and that can be important for several reasons, including pulling out you know, a more diverse set of behaviors that an animal might express and seeing how those behaviors change in disease. Um, you, uh, if you use motion capture, those things in the environment will block the line of sight to the camera and you can no longer do 3D reconstruction. And so what we focused on was a deep learning computer vision based system for doing markerless motion capture in animals using a small number of cameras. And that system is shown here in schematic form. Animal goes in an arena. We have a small set of cameras that are synchronized in time. And so then we get these multi-view video recordings and those multi-view video recordings are passed through our algorithm and out pops the three-dimensional positions of all of these body landmarks that are being tracked. You know, in total, we would refer to that as the 3D animal pose, okay? Here's a, you know, promotional video actually rendered from real data that we measured in animals. You put an animal in an arena, you measure it from multiple cameras, multiple different camera viewpoints, and then you feed those through our algorithm, and it will then pop out the three-dimensional position of body landmarks in the animal, and those body landmarks can be tracked over time. And the system 
we design to work in more natural settings right, where there are items in the environment and it, you know designed it to be somewhat of us to occlusions and then also to transfer across species so we worked in primarily in rodents but we also demonstrated the technology in marmoset in birds and also have some preliminary data in humans okay so i'm not going to go into too much detail about the computer vision part of it i'm actually going to focus most on the analysis part and showing what the analysis can be used for but i will give a quick summary of what the system looks like and so we use so remember that motion capture relied on this idea that you could take in the individual 2D images from different cameras, right, that are streaming in over time, and then detect the landmarks that you want to track in 2D, and then triangulate those 2D positions to 3D to get this 3D reconstruction of the body. It turns out when you're using a small number of cameras that this becomes difficult in terms of being able to detect the landmarks that you want to track, because, you know, as the animal is turning around, it's blocking the line of sight to individual landmarks. And this becomes an issue for getting robust 3D reconstruction of the animal body. And so instead, we took a different approach that allowed us to learn more about the geometry of the body in 3D with deep learning. And that involved doing something called unprojection, using projective geometry to take 2D images from these different cameras and create three-dimensional versions of them by sort of ray tracing through 3D space. And once we've created these volumetric representations of the images, we can combine them into this metric 3D feature space. So now this is a, a real 3D input to a 3D convolutional neural network, which then can directly predict the three-dimensional positions of these body landmarks that we're tracking over, over time. And we published this in Nature Methods last year, and we refer to the technology as DANCE for three-dimensional aligned neural network for computational ethology, ethology being the study of, of animal behavior. Okay, so when it's all said and done, um, if you have questions about how it's trained, I can maybe take those later on, but I want to get towards the behavioral analysis. This is the kind of data that, that streams in. So you put the animal in an arena, you know, it's exploring things in the arena and it's expressing different behaviors. And then we get these traces over time of the positions of the, of the animal's body landmarks. And what I want you to see in this stream down here is that sometimes the traces look different, right? Sometimes there's some oscillation, sometimes there's a big deflection, and that is all reflecting different types of behaviors that the animal is expressing at any given time, right? So the animal might rear up on its hind limbs, it might start grooming itself, right? It might be walking, and all of that can be found, or at least just recorded in these traces. And so the first thing that we did was ask, can we develop a method for automatically detecting when animals are in different behaviors? Okay, so then we can get these little behavioral summaries of what the animal is doing, and then we can ask how those behavioral summaries are changing, right, as a quantitative measure in, in different diseases and re in response to different drug perturbations. Okay, so I'll give a little brief summary of how that, that's done. So this is another representation of the type of streaming data that comes off of our 3D tracking algorithm, DANCE. You get these waveforms. These are now, I think, the velocities of a subset of the markers. And I, as I told you before, there are signatures of different behaviors right, that are inside those traces. How can we go about pulling them out so that we can automatically detect when different behaviors are occurring? Lots of different ways to do this. I will say, maybe pause to say, access to this kind of data, so many, many hours and days of three-dimensional body recordings in animals is, is new, right? And so the field as a whole is just starting to work out new approaches and algorithms for parsing all of these all of these data and to say something useful about animal behavior and to say something useful about the brain and to say something useful um, about, about neurological disease. And so I'll show you one, you know, this is the original approach that we took, continuing to iterate on this, and it has been successful for, for a few key applications. Okay, so then the question is, if we have these traces, how can we pull out features right, that are then important for detecting different types of behaviors? And we took an approach sort of trying to generate a holistic set of features from these traces by first doing a postural decomposition using PCA. So there's 60 dimensional traces coming out of our 3D tracking algorithm. And then we compress those to um, a set of 
10, which are the scores on eigenposes. You can think of eigenposes are, you know, a, a salient postural mode that occurs in the data. And then we can extract these salient postural modes by doing PCA. And each of the postural modes represents something different about how the animal is configuring its body or how it's moving the body. Um, okay, so for instance, you know, you can visualize what these eigenposes are after doing PCA by adding a little bit of eigenpose one onto the median pose, right? And you can see that the animal goes up and down. So eigenpose one is capturing something about rearing behavior. Eigenpose two seems to capture something about head inflection and eigenpose four seems to capture something about turning. It doesn't really matter what they are. The point is to show that this decomposition is giving us interesting summary features now about the entire body and the, the body is doing interesting things. Okay. So now we get these streaming traces of the decomposed posture scores. One extra step that we do is that we need to introduce information um, or extract information, I should say, about how the body is changing over time. We don't want just a static set of features like at this moment in time, the animal's body is you know, in this pose, right? We need to see how that the animal's body is changing over time because how the animal's body is changing over time is, you know, what is defining one of these behaviors. And so to extract that temporal information, we used a, we generated spectrograms, used a time frequency transform of all the different eigenpostures. And so what this gives us is you know, the power of the different frequency components of the eigenposture traces. And we get one of those for each frame. And now we get this high dimensional feature vector. If we sort of collate all of those for each frame, then describing the, you know, what the body is doing on different time scales um, and at different frequencies in a small window around each time point. Okay. Um, all right. So then we get, we have this high dimensional future vector. And then simply what we do with that is we use T-SNE, um, which I hope many of you are familiar with. It's a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique. And we take those high dimensional future vectors and embed them into this 2D space. And you get this map. This is now a behavioral map of all the different behaviors that the rat is executing. And so we've taken a bunch of recordings, we've extracted these spatial temporal features, and now we're embedding them into the space. And what you're seeing in this map is anywhere where there's a sort of darker spot, those are specific types of behaviors that are being executed more than others. You know, the darker it is, the more often that behavior is expressed. And the organization of this map is that there are a bunch of clusters in the map that we can cluster out. And each of those little regions here defined in this watershed cluster are defining different behavioral subtypes that the animal can execute. You can also go into this map, so this comprehensive behavioral map of all that the animal is doing, and you can go in and look at all of them and annotate this map and put names to it, right? So we have these hundreds and hundreds of subtypes of behaviors, but we find if we go in and look at these maps that there seems to be this coarser um, geography to these maps, where there's also 12 course categories within which little subtypes of these behaviors exist. Right? So these are the you know, 12 course categories that we can automatically extract in this behavioral map profile representation of behavior. And here's examples of, you know, if we go in once we have this map and then we just say, show me, you know, give me uh, 16 different examples of the animal doing that, just reaching in and pulling out points from the map, you can see how consistent the clustering seems to be in this space, right? So these are just examples of different behavioral clusters that we can pull out. Okay, so this is now a behavioral mapping technique that's quantifying all that the animal is doing and you know, gives us an opportunity to start exploring how what the animal is doing is changing across experimental conditions. Before going into you know, how we quantify those differences, I want to pause and talk about a motivation for a quantification layered on top of that, you know, finding behaviors in these animals. Okay, and that is, um, you know, one hypothesis in the animal literature is that animal behavior is organized in a hierarchy, where at some lower level you have, you know, the movement of individual limbs, and then you can combine the movement of those individual limbs into a coordinated full. Uh, full body movement, which you might call an individual behavioral type, right? And that over time, an animal is then expressing 
different types of behaviors, you might then walk and then turn and then walk and then sniff and then walk, active sniff, eat, eat. Okay, but then it doesn't stop there in terms of this description of behavior. The idea is that individual behaviors might be chained together in specific patterns that are always executed in the same way. So there's some statistical dependency over shorter time scales to create things called sequences. And these sequences are just individual behavioral elements that are always executed in sequence, right? Um, so for instance, one sequence might be an explore sequence, and that's when a walk, then a turn, then a walk gets executed. And anytime a walk, turn, walk gets executed, the animal is expressing this explore sequence, right? Or a different one might be this approach food sequence here, or my favorite sequence, you know, the, the eat, eat sequence, right? So these are all different things that the animal might execute now together. In turn, there are longer time scale statistical dependencies between behaviors where the entire sort of repertoire of the sequences that an animal is expressing is changed depending on the mood essentially of the animal, right? And, um, you know, I think that you probably um, through introspection can, you know, know that depending on your mood, you express different types of behaviors. Some of them are more extreme than others. If you're sleeping, obviously you're expressing one particular type of behavior, or a small set of behaviors. If you're energetic or lethargic, playful, threatened, aroused, all of these will then influence what types of behaviors that you will do. Okay. And so, um, you know, the thought is that that occurs with animals. And of course, if you think on some really high level in terms of, of time scale, right, all of this can be influenced by different diseases that the animal might have, um, and also the personality of the subject. And so um, th that's all to say what we've done in terms of our approach to analyzing behavior is that we can quantify automatically now the expression of all levels of this hierarchy. So the, the different body part kinematics, the different behaviors, the different sequences that are being expressed, the different states that are being expressed. And we can use those different automatic quantifications at these different scales to look for a myriad of different effects of, of disease, right? And of drugs, right? So to have this deeper phenotype that we can now talk about in terms of the behaviors that, that animals are expressing. And so I'll just give you another example of what I mean by these sequences and states. So I don't think I showed this ethogram before. So this is what I showed in the maps before was, um, let me just go back actually. So there's little color codes here. So that's what the color codes mean on that ethogram. But all that that ethogram is showing is that if you take any moment in time and you take that moment in time and then you throw it into that behavioral map and then you ask what behavior is being expressed at that moment in time, you can put that in as a little tick mark in this ethogram representation. And at the next frame, you know, you go see what behavior the subject is in and then you put a tick mark in whatever behavior is being expressed at that time point. And then you just plot that over time and you get this little behavioral barcode right, of whatever the animal was doing um, based on behavioral identity, right? So the y-axis here are all the different behaviors enumerated, and then this axis here is time. Okay, so what that means is at the level of individual behaviors in this ethogram, each of those little dots there is a single behavior in this representation, and you can see evidence already for sequences and also states. So sequences are little clusters of behaviors. I mean, the red ones are there. Those, those are actually longer dependencies. Uh, you might be more state-like, but you can see obviously little patterns where the animal's doing one particular thing or one particular set of things. And depending on the time scale, of those dependencies, you're seeing either sequences or states that the animal is engaged in. Okay, so that's what I mean by a sequence or a state. And so let's then look at a specific example of sequences, right? So I just want to give you an idea of what these sequences look like. So here on the bottom, this behaviors ethogram, that's what you saw on the previous slide, except I've removed the color and this is from a different time period. What you're seeing on the top is the sequence identity. So we can convert that behavior level ethogram into now this matrix over time of sequences. And that's because we developed an algorithm to automatically detect these shorter time scale dependencies and the types of behaviors. And based on that, we can then, you know, each time point has a behavioral ID. It also has a sequence ID. And later on, I'll show you examples of, of sequence IDs. And then, so we can not only say the animal is engaged in this behavior in the sequence in the state, but we can also, of course, see what that sequence is. And the way that sort of a quick summary, I know this plot looks kind of crazy, but a quick summary of what a sequence is, is to look, you know, what are the behaviors that compose a particular sequence? And so 
this is just a matrix now of 22 different sequences that we can detect. And then the course categories here, and you can see depending on the color here, um, sequences are composed of different types of behaviors. And so for instance, this sequence 21 is a big red, you know, uh, large percentage of the time. In sequence 21, the animal is doing a left scratching behavior. And so that now describes what sequence 21 is. And so here's actually an example of sequence 21 when we automatically extract it from what the behavior is doing, there's a set of five different behaviors that the animal is just cycling through pretty regularly whenever it's in this one particular sequence. This is um, an interesting behavior where the animal will, you know, scratch its head, then scratch its body, and then lick its toe. And so whatever. But we can capture that automatically, and we can assign that a sequence ID. And here's another one. So um, in some of the experiments that we have, there's a little lever in the arena and the animals can go and play with the lever and we can tell automatically when the animal is engaged in this lever pressing task because there's a sequence that the animal strictly follows right so that's another example of a sequence and you can see that sequence has a different expression in this um, behavioral usage matrix where the animal is doing rearing and right grooming right instead of left grooming right so this is sort of a quick that matrix is a quick summary of what's going on and that allows us to interpret when we see differences in sequence expression across experimental conditions, we can interpret what, what is actually changing in terms of the underlying behavior. Uh, and then finally, here's just an example of states. So states are these longer time scale dependencies and relationships between behavior. And that's reflected here. Here's a different ethergram now with a different set of behaviors where you see these really long periods where the animal seems engaged in you know, a set of behaviors. And our algorithm can automatically detect when the animal is engaged in those states. There's a smaller number of states because they're longer time scale. And the states also look different. If you go in and see, say, like, show me the behaviors over a particular state when the animal is in state one versus state three, you can see it's not like this regular pattern cycling through, you know, five or 10 behaviors over time, like you see in a sequence, right? The states are not a strict, you know, set of order of a behavioral expression but they do change the probability that certain behaviors are expressed. So these are the same 15 behaviors in a maintenance state versus an exploration state. You can see the exploration state, the animals engaged in um, you know, these behaviors towards the top and maintenance, these behaviors towards the bottom. Okay, so those are differences between states and sequences. Okay, now that we have those definitions, we can begin to ask you know, at those various levels in the hierarchy, do we see now new types of behavioral phenotypes that we haven't been able to detect before, or we haven't been able to quantify at least before. And the first thing that we did is that we looked at just phenotyping drugs. So seeing what happens when you give some pretty basic drugs, in this case, caffeine and amphetamine to the animals. And you know, can we now better detect what's happening or can we reveal new effects of these drugs in these animals? And the reason why we chose these drugs is because there's an interesting effect at lower doses where you know, existing technology, which is just, you know, knowing the position and velocity of an animal, so not capturing the entire posture of the animal and how it's moving all of its body parts over time. Traditional metrics would not, uh, quantitative metrics, automated quantitative metrics, would not be able to tell the difference between these drugs at those doses because it just um, increases the, the movement velocity of the animal. That's all that it does, or at least that's what was previously thought using quantitative techniques. Simply by looking at three very coarse categories of behaviors that we can now define on our maps, we can, we can see a new type of divergent effect, quantify a divergent effect that wasn't quantifiable before. And the, so let me just unpack this graph. So this is now gonna be a fraction of time executing three even bigger categories than my 12 coarse categories. And you can see the amount of time that animals are active is, is you know, pretty similar in the caffeine and amphetamine case. But as soon as you look at different types of behaviors, so an idling behavior and a grooming behavior, right, if, you then, if you summarize these behaviors and how often the animals engage in these behaviors, you see this divergent effect right, that we're now automatically able to quantify. Right? So while caffeine causes an increase in activity, it does it at the expense of idling behaviors and it keeps grooming behaviors the same relative to baseline. Whereas amphetamine decreases the amount of time the animal spends grooming increases the amount of time, uh, you know, and the idling time is, is similar to, to baseline. 
So that's a very coarse level, but of course we have these very detailed maps now of what the animal is doing. And so just here's just an example, um, you know, not really, yeah, anyway. So, so these are those big behavioral maps that I showed you before. And, you know, now you can already see differences here. Of course, the statistics are not quantified, but, you know, just so you get the picture of what's going on. Uh, zoom in on this region here in the map. This is the region that contains all the different types of rearing behaviors that the animal will do. And, you know, there's this big change in what behaviors are being expressed. Remember, each individual point on this map is a different subtype of behavior. And just as an example, you can see that this amphetamine seems to drastically upregulate the amount of time the animal is in a low rearing behavior. And caffeine, instead of that low rearing behavior, upregulates the amount of time the animal is doing high rearing behavior. And so this is really sort of a new lens onto what the animal is doing that we can distinguish now these different types of rearing behaviors and automatically detect them and find differences across these conditions. Okay, but that's at the level of behaviors. And I'll show you what happens. We can look at states. And so now they hear these complicated behavioral usage tables, but I just want to cover up most of that and just point you to what we found is that caffeine upregulates six states that are not found in amphetamine relative to baseline, right? So there's already, that's a new description. Caffeine has this effect. These six states are changed. And then of course we can see what those six states are in caffeine. They tend to be states that involve rearing behaviors um, or grooming behaviors. Amphetamine in contrast upregulates relative to baseline a different set of states. And those states have a different composition. Those states um, typically involve walking behavior, right? And so now we can automatically quantify the differences between those behavioral conditions. And we can also go in as a sanity check and ask, what do those different states look like in these animals? We can just go back to the, to the movies and say, um, you know, just pull out periods where the animal is in one of those upregulated amphetamine states or in the upregulated caffeine state. And you can see that, yes, by eye, we were able to identify what looks like a very obvious real effect, right? Caffeine seems to these perturbed states or these new states in caffeine, there's obviously a lot of rearing behaviors and amphetamine, a lot of walking and turning behaviors. Okay, and then I'll show you two more quick examples of phenotyping examples in animals, and then I'll, um, I'll wrap up and start talking about CTE radiology reports. Maybe I'll actually pause for questions. So if you have questions, think about what they are. I'll pause before I start part two so I can answer anything. Okay, so here's another example. This is now disease, not, not drug. And this is a fragile X syndrome, you know, autism spectrum disorder in, in rats. And, you know, we can already see at the level of these coarse behavioral categories and the, the time that animals spend expressing these, these different behaviors, that grooming seems upregulated. It was kind of already known for this fragile X disorder. But what we, what we can do that's new uh, is detect you know, sequences, right? New uh, perseverative grooming sequences that are upregulated in this autism spectrum disorder model. And, you know, also interestingly is individualistic. So there's some individuality between different animals in terms of the, the behavioral phenotype that they express in this disorder. Right? So that's what all of these little lines down here are. These are all different sequences and you could see the different rats upregulate different sequences in this <clears throat> experimental group, this fMR one knockout fragile X animal. Okay, and so I'll then quickly just show you one thing we've been working on recently is social behavioral quantification because we're interesting in you know, origins of social behavior, but also diseases that affect social behavior. And so here's an example of tracking rats now, two rats interacting together. This is actually quite a hard computer vision problem um, and we're getting better and better at solving. And given that we can now quantify social behavior, we can do lots of cool things, including start to describe the entire social behavioral repertoire in these animals, but also critically start to investigate, you know, what are the specific behavioral changes that we see in different disease models? And so um, CATNAP2 is an autism spectrum disorder um, model, and we have these knockout rats. And... Um, you can now look at the differences in, in behavioral expression in these behavioral maps, but now these are social behavioral maps. We've embedded, you know, two animals into this map. And, you know, again, this is all still preliminary, but you can see that we start to reveal differences in this map profile representation of the animal that seems to highlight particular behaviors that are upregulated in autism um, relative to wild type. And we can go in and we can start to ask, what are those particular behaviors? And, um, and, go, and go in and visualize them. So we find 
For instance, that behaviors that are upregulated in this catnap mutant relate to freezing behaviors, retreating behaviors, fast aggression behaviors, right? So these are all turned on in this model of autism spectrum disorder and now become targets of you know, future studies to try to develop treatments that return these to normal, right? return these to wild type. And so that's one of the, the dreams that we have about the technology in terms of the preclinical model. And then uh, unfortunately these videos don't play, I realized at the last minute, but we've also been quantifying human behavior and we have collaborators in, in neurology that um, you know, we've already recruited a little cohort of Parkinson's patients and um, are beginning to ask whether we can do similar similar studies to what I just showed you in animals, but now using this movement profiling in, in human patients. Okay, so this is the end of that part one, the unconventional, you know, medical image type. And, you know, uh, like all of my projects, they tend to be very collaborative and I have a lot of people to thank in, in particular for the social work. Um, Ugne uh, at Harvard is postdoc teaching in my lab. At Duke, I've worked together on that. Um, ben Selvetsky is her, her PI, and so that's all amazing data. And then the previous work was a bunch of amazing collaborators, including Jesse Marshall, who was a postdoc at Harvard and is now at, at Meta. Okay, why don't I just pause quickly if, if there's any Q&A. If not, I will go on. No open questions. Yeah, if, uh, yeah oh. Tim, if that's okay with you, let's, let's proceed with the second part and we'll leave the questions to the end. I have a couple of questions, but I want to encourage everybody. Uh, if you have a question, just type it in in the, the Q&A uh, section and I'll, I'll read it uh, uh, after, the, after the end of the presentation. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to talk about radiology report, automated extraction from radiology reports, and I'm going to quickly, oops. Okay. And so here's the motivation for this. So this is part of a larger project that developed uh, a couple of years ago out of a DHI, Duke Institute for Health Innovation, RFA grant, um, together with a bunch of brilliant visionaries in the Department of Neurosurgery and the, the Duke Division for Global Neurosurgery and Neurology. And you know, it relates to trying to develop new machine learning models for decision support for traumatic brain injury. Okay, traumatic brain injury has been this very sort of hard to pin down disorder in clinical contexts, um, you know, uh, which is a shame because it affects um, a bunch of Americans per year and is a leading cause of death and disability in young adults. And you know, one of the big issues with it, I mean, part of it is related to actionability, which is something that we've realized in terms of, so even if you had some Oracle that could tell you what to do, how you act on that, you know, we, there's still, still research required. Um, but four things that are actionable um, and things like triage, we still don't have like a very good and robust way to, you know, know when someone needs TBI treatment, okay, for the treatment that does exist. And, <clears throat> You know, our goal has been over the last year or two is to build a machine learning based approach that can help support decision making for TBI. Right? Um, one of the more basic models, which I, you know, I think I'll primarily I might talk about in this talk is related to just like patient comes in at the ED and you need to make decisions in the ED context about what to do. Um, that was our original focus. And, you know, we now have a new grant to begin to expand that focus to sort of be a an online, um, you know, evolving update in terms of, um, you know, decision support, right? And here's a very simple example of what that looks like. You know, what's particularly interesting, at least for me, and I, and I think others about this project, is that, you know, the, the decision-making that currently exists in the clinic by, by practitioners involves imaging data, right? And also parameters that come from the electronic health record. And, and so I think that this, you know, in addition to being a very important problem, gives us an opportunity to start exploring ways to support models that are multimodal, where we fuse image elements with electronic health records, sort of tabular elements, um, and also begin to think about the infrastructure necessary in hospitals to serve images in real time to these types of models, which in most cases, you know, has not been the focus, um, or at least has not been what people have done thus far, which has typically been dedicated to, to EHR. And there's, there's a lot of groups now looking at developing the infrastructure required for real-time image processing. So, you know, I'll stick to 
Now the TBI component of this, uh, you know, but anyway, so that's the idea. Dream model, patient comes in, you know, the ED uh, type model, patient comes in, they meet our cohort criteria for potential head injury. And I'll get to what those co cohort criteria are in the next slide. And then, you know, there's some magic model <laughs> that then produces some risk scores that can help healthcare providers make decisions about what to do with the patient, right? And so, you know, proposed outcomes that we have proposed in terms of this model are things like, you know, IP admission from ED. So, you know, risk of this, risk of ICU admission from ED, risk of going to the operating room, of developing cerebral edema or hematoma or elevated intracranial pressure and, and things like in-hospital mortality. So this is, you know, the this is the cohort that we pulled. Um, you know, like any of these big data projects in the hospital, like there's there's more work than you think in terms of defining this cohort and validating this cohort. And this is this is the end result of that of that work. And this was in collaboration with with DHI as well. So we actually have this very large cohort that we pulled. So patients from 2014 to 2020 at any of the Duke University Health System hospitals that met the following criteria. Um, you know, so either a TBI diagnosis by ICD code plus a trauma protocol C CT of the head, trauma protocol being without contrast, um, or a TBI diagnosis plus a TBI chief complaint without an image. TBI chief complaint here, uh, oh, sorry, no, I'll get to what that is in a second, or TBI chief complaint plus the trauma protocol CT of the head. And the reason why I brought this TBI chief complaint on is that it's primarily to capture we end up expanding the cohort because it's capturing people who might not then go on to have an ICD code diagnosis for TBI, but did have a, a head injury that was serious enough to get a CT. And those are you know, important examples for both training and validating these types of models that we're thinking of. Okay, so you know, all of that's great. Uh, I unfortunately, I'm not gonna say a lot about the actual model, but I will tell you about a key component of something that we've been developing which is critical for, you know, not just our project in terms of building the image side of the model, but also I think others um, who are in this, this head CT space. And so one of the big issues that we ran into when first just playing around with some simple deep learning models for image analysis on these data was that the ICD codes that we were relying on for image labels were unreliable. Okay, so we would like go in and we would see these clear discrepancies between what was in the radiology report in terms of patient had a hematoma versus what the ICD code was coding for. And I think I'm being relatively new to this type of, of, of work. I was late to the party. I think it was already sort of known that these things can be a little sketchy, uh, these ICD codes. And so um, what we really wanted then was to go to the gold standard, the radiology report, and extract all the labels for different image findings that we would need. Of course, this is a daunting task. We had 65,000 plus radiology reports. And you know, if we wanted to get labels for all of those, then we could incorporate them into our TBI decision support model, you know, either for training the image model component or even using what's extracted off of those reports as features into the, you know, the, the prognostic model or the predictive model. How could we do that? Right? It would be this painstaking annotation. Um, you know, obviously not not feasible. And so we thought about this and, you know, I think there were a lot of ideas about, well, whatever, use some some fancy transformer, large, large language model or whatever to do this. Um, but what we settled on was something far simpler and had been successful, uh, successfully implemented by a group at Duke for a different type of CT scan before. And actually Munchich also worked on this. This is for chest radiographs. And it was a simple rule-based model um, that is almost so simple that it seems kind of silly. But what's cool about it is it works really well, despite it, and I'll show you what it looks like in a second. It works really well on a tiny training set. We only have to label that many um, reports and it's expandable and interpretable. And um, I, I'm really impressed with it. And it's, you know, uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> okay. so. Uh, and here's what it is. So this is how simple it is. As I said, it's almost silly how simple it is. Um, of course, if you look at all of the, the subcomponents, it gets a little bit complicated uh, in that it's a rule-based model and the workflow looks like this. You take radiology report in on structured text. You pass it through a set of negation rules. And these negation rules pull out 
words from the report, like delete entire pieces of text that um, meet some negation rules or something, because, you know, no hematoma, no, you know, not, not of this, not of that. There's a bunch of rules that are defined for getting rid of those. And then once all of that text is removed, then there's a set of matching rules for the remaining text that match to a particular image finding that we're trying to use as a label. Um, and I'll show you what that training looks like. And, and here the image label is 20, one of 22 different CT findings that we want to use for our downstream modeling and that in conversation with domain experts deemed to be important. And so here's how you actually train it. Um, so the first thing you do is you need some sort of ground truth data. So someone does have to go in and annotate some reports. In our case, it's only a thousand radiology reports in the, T the TBI cohort. And they go through and they, you know, of the 22 different image findings, they go and say, you know, positive or negative on all those 22 for those 1,000 reports. And then um, domain experts propose a set of rules for the rule-based model for automatically extracting these findings. And it's a small set of rules and it's probably wrong and needs to be refined. And that's fine because what happens is you then take a subset of those 1,000 reports. In our case, it was 200 radiology reports. And the domain experts start to just, on that training set, build new rules, both the negation rules and the positive finding matching rules. And you know, just on that particular split of the data, um, try to maximize the accuracy right, of, the, of the automatic extractor. And so that leads to this sort of diverse list of rules. Um, you know, some of which were on the previous slide, a few examples. And then once you're done, you're satisfied with the performance there. You validate it on this, you know, test set, which we held out to the very end, 800 reports. And, you know, you can see, you know, I think very impressive um, performance, especially on the key major findings that we believe are most important for, for a traumatic brain injury application. And those are listed down here, right? But, you know, Amazing specificity, you know, sensitivity, a little bit lower, but, but particularly good. Okay. Um, yeah, so we plan to integrate that into our own, the, the sort of the TBI prognostic model that I outlined, but you can imagine other use cases for this. Um, and sorry if I, yeah, okay. Anyway, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but you saw it on the other slide. And this this model was originally developed by Rachel Dralos in a paper from, from last year for chest, chest CT. Yeah, so you can imagine this being, you know, soft ground truth labels for imaging models. That's what we plan to use them for, for a TBI model, potentially quality assurance for radiology reports. Some applications of a sort of related technique that we saw at CNS a few weeks ago, or some of my students saw it at CNS was like an on the fly registry for, for procedure notes. And of course, you know, epidemiological studies also possible. Okay, so um, thanks for that. I think we have like a, reasonable amount of time for questions now. This project also, a lot of work, also a small component of a larger project. The folks working on the actual rule-based model projects, Pranav, Cash, Nihal, Adil, um, but there's many others that are working on the TBI project as a whole. Pranav, Manjunath, I wanted to um, show some of his work, he's doing some amazing work. And, you know, next time I give a talk, I can show you the amazing stuff that he's doing. Um, and, you know, together with Brian Lerner, both both PhD students who are working on this project. And then, um, you know, a host of others, which are, which are all listed here. Thanks, now I can take questions on both. Thank you, Tim. And um, very interesting presentation. Um, so again, I would like to encourage everybody to just type your questions in the Q and A uh, portion of our uh, of uh, the Q and A button available in Zoom. Um, so uh, to the first part of your uh, presentation, um, so the, the, your approach uh, is is focused on um, detecting landmarks and. Uh, what I would call uh, call a somewhat structured analysis, right? When you're maybe a bit more explainable, right? Where we can see actually how those um, animals move and then you're extracting uh, features in various ways. Have you thought or tried looking at the video in a, a less structured way 
and just relating the, the entire video to whether it's a it's a named behavior right or the uh, specific condition great question so um two things so we personally haven't spent a lot of time doing this so people in the lab are thinking about doing it especially for the new clinical applications that we're talking about um just casting a sort of a wide net i i particularly not a big fan of it because of the interpretability issue there's also this issue with three-dimensionality and so how do you sort of combine you know independent 2d measurements and if you only have one 2d measurement and you're trying to work directly on the images you know are you capturing you know, information, or how do you fuse that information across views, if not via via these landmarks? So that's that's one solution for that. There's also the interpretability element, but there are others in the field who who insist that you know this this is the way to go. The most successful actually is using a depth camera image, and then not really doing anything with the depth camera image. So you get some sort of three dimensionality with the depth camera, and then you you know embed or do various other statistical modeling of time series of those depth images, and um. In that case, works works pretty well, though. Though then the um, it sort of almost captures it seems a complementary sometimes set of, of behaviors. Although no one has really competed them head to head yet. Um, I think that for what we are capturing, like these skeletal features, my thinking is what we're doing is fine. I think as soon as you want to start considering other stuff that we can't capture with these landmarks, that might be important. And you have to think about what those are. So facial features, right? Seeing what the face is doing, potentially seeing soft tissue features, um, you know, like puffing the body up and, and constricting the body. Those are things, of course, that we miss. And, you know, to see to what extent we gain, a, you know, an even higher resolution view onto behavior. I think it's an important question. Uh, and and yeah, we're thinking about doing. It's my long-winded answer. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, so it seems like interpretability is an important aspect of this research, right? And maybe is is that because traditionally a lot of this research has been done in a you know by just extracting those behaviors, is visually I, I'm guessing here, and and finding those correlations and and sort of this. This I guess um, that that uh, link between the the traditional way of doing this and this way is uh, you know, people want. Yeah, to I think that that the... is a. Yeah, I think you picked up up on something there. Right? I think it's just yeah. Um, directly classifying the images, saying right, yeah, is a little bit too similar to what people have done in the past, and you don't get a quantitative metric of what. You know, if we set up the landmark tracking system correctly, right, you can get very close to sort of the intended output of the brain, right? Like the movement, right? You know, maybe even at some point you can get the the actual muscles and what they're doing, right? At the very least, this is the instruction the brain is outputting, which turns to then turns out to then compose behavior. Um, and so I think from the perspective of sort of mechanistic neurobiologists, right? You know, I, I think just saying some black box prediction of the animals engaged in this based on a video. I mean, one other thing you can do is whatever you can, you can point to pieces on the video, like little heat maps about what might be responsible right. for, you know, dictating a certain action. Uh, and yeah, it just hasn't, um, it just doesn't have the flavor, I think, of the, the quantitative analysis people are looking for, especially if you're at like the mechanism of this neural, you know, this neuron dies and it, it does this. What does it do? It changes. Yeah. I don't know. Some, yeah. yeah. No, no, I understand. It's, it looks like it might be, might end up being a pool from that, you know, a, a traditional or similarity to, to the traditional methodology, right? And, and, and potentially performance, right? Because at the end, if, if that analysis that is, uh, you could argue, not limited by our understanding of behaviors right and and what behaviors mean and so on achieves better performance then uh well you could make an argument for it right but then yeah it's just yeah, it comes to be uh maybe yeah pretty, i i, you know, I agree and... um, what's interesting is also you know so in like the human exit recognition computer vision space it, it's not a lot of like first key point stuff i mean sometimes they'll 
they'll do key points plus images and show a little performance boost. Um, but but the big difference between what those approaches typically do and, and what we're doing is that they have some prescribed set of K behavioral categories that they're trying to classify the behavior into, right? And so one key component, whether it's analyzing the images directly or the key points, I think it's slightly more natural thinking about the landmarks and key points is that you sort of have this unsupervised discovery of new types of behaviors, especially how those behaviors change after some perturbation, right? And if uh, you have a classifier built that buckets everything into, you know, 10 prescribed categories and then you know, the angular velocity of the right arm is changing, you know, in a Parkinson's model, right? Where does that sort of fit in? Mm -hmm. How do you detect that? Um, and one natural way to detect it is by looking at where the behavior goes in this representation, this map representation that we use. So has, has this research led to uh, a discovery of new kind of behavioral categories or new behaviors? that have not been uh, used before but yeah 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 we don't harp on it because it's people are bored by that like cataloging and stamp collecting yeah no one has described many of these things right? i mean the course behavioral categories is about you know mostly what people have discovered before and people have focused on grooming a lot and so like people have looked at different frequencies of grooming but not nearly the, the number of categories that we discover Okay, have you uh, have you been able to name all of these categories? Because uh, my collaborator that. Jesse at one point named all of them, and I think he stashed them somewhere. But it was too, it was too ridiculous. Uh, well, but, but yeah, so that's interesting. It's it's more of a uh, uh, maybe a philosophical question. But so is it? <clears throat> were you able to name those categories in a way that they would still correspond to people's intuition of a certain behavior, right? Because you presented thing here that are quite intuitive, like, uh, you know, like uh, moving, sniffing, eating, right? But uh, were there some behaviors that were clearly visible in your data, right, as individual categories, but but you couldn't really relate them to something intuitive? Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially just like gray area, you know, kind of like a lot of it was just like, well, it kind of looks like this one behavior, I see, I other see. behavior, and where do you put it? And yeah, what do you call it? And, and um I see. Some of them by eye, even, right? Like you, some of them, you only resolve these differences. And if you look at the traces, right, you you look at the numbers, right? And by eye, you're like, what was that? <laughs> and then like only after looking at the numbers can you focus in on what exactly is different. And, and so that's another, ex you know, example of where just relying on human observation, right, is particularly limited, right? If you're missing these fine details in behavioral categorizations, right? And then you have, you know, some disease or some treatment affecting those things that were previously unresolvable, right? Then you you toss that out as a failure. Um, all right. Well, uh, we're the, the, our time is up. Um, thank you very much uh, for the, for really a uh, great presentation. I think uh, uh, thought provoking, and we're looking forward to seeing what the uh, you know, the next things that come out of it. Thanks, Patrick.